Uh, our next speaker is going to talk about Beyond Gemstones, the medical, industrial, scientific, and computational applications of lab diamonds. Please welcome the CEO of Ada Diamonds, Jason Payne. So it's quite the tough act to follow, to follow element six as they talk through all the uses of diamonds. So I'll do my best to not be redundant and riff on top of Daniel's excellent presentation. So I want to start by talking through the history of laboratory-grown diamonds and then categorize diamonds into five separate types before I dive into 20 different examples of how diamonds are used today. Um, Daniel covered the post-World War II history, but I want to go back a few years. And I actually want to go all the way back to the 18th century when Lavoisier proved that diamonds were made out of carbon. People have been trying to grow diamonds since that day, but it wasn't until there was an acute lack of diamond grit for cutting steel and drawing wire during World War II that we saw a huge increase in efforts to grow diamonds. And as Daniel mentioned, uh, in the 50s, three different researchers broke through and successfully grew diamonds. Okay, so let me categorize diamonds into five categories. The first three are naturally occurring and the second two are not. So first is nano diamonds, which are grown by explosive detonation or meteorite impacts. And what's interesting about nano diamonds is it was discovered by accident by the Soviet Union as they were using carbon in their triggers for their nuclear weapons and got microscopic diamonds as a result. Second is diamond grit or BORT, which today 98% of consumption of diamond grit around the world is coming from laboratory grown diamonds. And third is monocrystal diamonds, uh, which I'll define as seeded or plate grown HBHT or CBD diamonds of significant size. So the next two are unnatural types of diamond. The first is called polycrystalline diamond, which is a matrix of interlocked small diamonds uh, that somewhat eliminates the weaker plane within a diamond and allows much larger sizes of diamond material to be grown. And as Daniel mentioned, has many or all of the properties of monocrystal diamonds. Uh, the second is what I'll call diamond-like carbon, or DLC, or thin film diamond. Uh, this is an amorphous form of carbon uh, that is deposited on a substrate material that can be metal, plastic, or glass that gives diamond-like properties to uh, that substrate material. And before I jump into the examples, I do want to mention that most of the examples that I'm talking about, for a variety of reasons, availability, cost, quality, et cetera, it's not feasible to use natural diamonds for these use cases. Um, so I'll start with what you think of when you think industrial diamonds. Uh, saw blades, drill bits, cutting. Um, today, pretty much any tunnel that you go through, uh, any concrete freeway you drive on, bridge you go over, uh, your granite countertops are all made with diamond saw blades or drill bits. And in fact, more than half of the oil extracted out of the earth today is extracted with drill bits, diamond-tipped drill bits. Uh, diamonds are also surgical knives. Uh, they're increasingly used for all sorts of surgery, with the leading surgery being eye surgery. Uh, diamonds are sharp, they're durable, they're naturally antibiotic, they're easy to clean. And they have one very big advantage over a metal scalpel, which is you can see through them. So as a surgeon, it makes it much easier to use this tool. Uh, diamonds are also orthopedic replacements. Uh, here on the left, I have a vertebrae disc replacement, in the center a hip, and then a knee replacement. I actually have a sample of the hip with me today, and I'll take a risk and pass this around, uh, so someone could please get this back to me. But diamond uh, is low friction, high durability, and biologically inert when it wears, producing particles in the body. So for all those reasons, this is an ideal material that you'll see many people around the world receive as implants. Get my mask. Thank you, sir. Uh, diamonds also keep sperm alive. Uh, it turns out that if you take a nano diamond uh, covered petri dish, sperm lasts 300% longer than they do in a traditional petri dish. Uh, and 
shockingly enough, the cost of that diamond coating is only about $100. So when you look at the value this can bring to couples that are looking to have a child in their lives, and you look at that price point, it's something that it's an economically viable use of diamond that's coming along today. Uh, the reason for this is that sperm, like many other cells, produce a toxic chemical as part of their life cycle. Uh, in the body, that chemical is very quickly absorbed, but on the petri disk, it stays and kills the sperm. But that material cannot bond to diamond, and that's why the sperm stay alive longer. Uh, diamonds are also used for drug delivery. Uh, it turns out that you can prepare the surface of a nano diamond to accept proteins or polymers and use that to bond medicine to diamond. You're then able to, with patches or direct injections, put that medicine along the top of the diamonds exactly in the body where it needs to be. And there's tremendous uh, clinical results coming out of putting, uh, excuse me, um, putting chemotherapy drugs into the exact tumor location where they need to be, and the diamonds are keeping that drug there. Uh, also on the left is a, a root canal where antibiotics are coated on nanodiamonds and injected into the canal uh, to prevent infection, and that's seeing very good results. And on the right is a contact lens that has medicine to fight glaucoma uh, injected into nanodiamonds and placed in the lens. So compared to eye drops, it's a far superior way to deliver medicine to help people save their sight. Uh, diamonds are also magnetic field sensors. Uh, Daniel covered this in depth, so I won't talk too, too much about it, but I will say that this is a commercially viable technology. So it's a little bit hard to see here, but there's a tip of diamond here that has a single NV defect in the diamond tip, and that produces a signal that can be detected by computers to detect those microscopic, minute magnetic fields that are coming from basically anything that's alive today. And as Daniel mentioned, that has potential for Alzheimer, but also in all sorts of other tumor detections and detection of infections and many other uh, negative uh, aspects of life today. Uh, diamonds are also fantastic detectors of radiation and x-ray. And so diamond as a very durable material in an extraordinarily high level of radiation simply produces a high quality electrical current uh, as a result of the amount of radiation that's passing through the diamond. And so something I want to give a huge shout out to Element 6 is their work uh, to discover the higgs boson as the detectors that they built for that project. It would not have been possible to have that monumental moment of science without the work of Element 6. Uh, diamonds also make your phone screen much stronger and better. Um, so uh, a thin film diamond can be coated on top of uh, more or less any transparent material, be it sapphire, silica, or even hardened glass like Gorilla Glass, and it gives about six times the strength and hardness to that screen than you get uncoated. On top of that, it also makes the screen about 800 times more thermally conductive. And so suddenly your screen, not only will it be less likely to shatter, it's also now a heat sink to make it easier to remove the waste heat from your electronic device. Uh, diamonds are also fantastic magnifying lenses. Um, so here I have at the bottom is a, what's called a Fresnel lens. This is basically like, like a lighthouse where it takes the energy and directs it all in one moving or one single direction. Uh, this Fresnel lens cut onto diamonds uh, empowers the Stanford Linear Accelerator to create light energy that is a billion times stronger than any naturally occurring light on Earth. Uh, these lenses used to be made out of gold. Uh, with that uh, machine running full power, the gold lenses would last 15 seconds before they failed. The diamond lens, oops, the diamond lens runs over a 12 hour shift with no degradation at all to show the difference in the quality of a diamond lens and a gold lens. Diamonds are also high pressure anvils. Uh, you can take two diamonds, hydraulically press them together along with a sample in the middle and generate over three times the pressure than is at the center of the earth. Put that another way, that's about uh, I think 10, excuse me, 10 million times the pressure that we have on the face of the earth. It's one terapascal is the record of pressure of two diamonds pressed together. 
Uh, furthermore, because diamond is optically transparent, you can detect what's happening to the sample through the diamond. You can put uh, light energy through the diamond to heat the sample. Um, and so it's an ideal material for a plethora of high pressure areas of research in material science, physics, and chemistry. Uh, as Daniel discussed, uh, diamonds are also water treatment tools. In addition to cleaning up highly toxic or polluted water, this is something that's used every day and increasingly more so. A more mundane example of this is that citrus farmers are now using boron-doped diamonds to efficiently clean the bacteria off of their produce before it goes uh, onto market. So that moldy orange that you have at the bottom of your bag of oranges is much less likely to occur thanks to diamond. Diamonds are also bearings. This is a little counterintuitive. You think diamond, you think grit, you think uh, abrasive. It turns out that if you polish a diamond, it's actually extraordinarily low coefficient of friction, much lower than the coefficient of friction of metal. Um, and so in small and large uses, we have bearings uh, online around the world. Uh, here on the left, I have diamond bearings that are primarily used in oil and gas drilling. Uh, so these are very large uh, bearings. Uh, a huge uh, area of focus of these is undersea applications because diamond doesn't corrode in that environment of seawater and works very well as a bearing without any lubrication, just using ambient seawater as lubrication. On the right here, I have a much smaller bearing, and in this case, it's actually metal bearings that are DLC coated, as opposed to pucks of polycrystalline diamond here. But in both cases, these are far superior to the status quo, and in some cases can give a thousand times the uh, durability and wear and life cycle as a metal bearing. Uh, diamonds, Thin film diamond coating or DLC is also increasingly used in motors and transmissions to reduce friction in the system. And this is not something that's just in F1 cars and Ferraris. Your mundane Chevys, your Nissans are all moving towards diamond-like carbon to coat the moving or wear parts of their motor vehicles. Nissan believes that they can reduce the entire friction in their motors by 25% over uh, their metal motors by coating all of the moving parts with diamond-like carbon. Also somewhat ironically is that diamonds are an additive to oil that improves lubrication. Uh, when you go to the absolute smallest size of nano diamond, uh, that cubo-octahedral shape of that diamond behaves like a ball bearing. And so by simply dumping diamonds into your motor, you reduce the friction in your motor. And why that happens, if you look, if you think about this, you've got metal parts sliding metal on metal in friction, uh, whereas with uh, diamonds, nano diamonds, you have many ball bearings creating rolling friction instead of sliding friction in those interactions. And this is an example of a helicopter transmission where with stock lubricants, it quickly heats to 175 degrees Celsius, whereas by simply throwing diamonds in the oil, it's a much cooler, much more efficient, much lower friction system. Uh, we talked through uh, speakers, so I will gloss over that, um, but I will say that it's not only BMWs that are uh, using these speakers now, it's everything from two and a half million dollar Bugattis to Volvo SUVs, and multiple brands are embracing this for obvious reasons of quality. Uh, diamonds are also fantastic heat spreaders that are used in a plethora of applications from radars, increasingly cell phone towers or communication systems, uh, server farms, Bitcoining mining operation, which is, this is a Bitcoin mine here. So if any of you all hold Bitcoin, it very well may have been powered by diamond. Uh, one thing that I will point out that I find quite fascinating is that if you take isotopically pure carbon as your source or your donor carbon for your diamond growth, you can get 50% higher thermal conductivity. So you're talking almost an order of magnitude more thermal conductivity than the status quo. Um, diamonds are also hard drives. Uh, it turns out that nitrogen vacancy defect that we've talked so much about today, that can be a zero or one. And researchers have been able to use green lasers to wipe out all of the electrons and then use a high power red laser to create those bits. Uh, and they can also vary it. So as we talk about quantum computing, you can actually vary the energy that's imparted in the, uh, that electron to go su suppose between a zero and one. 
Um, the thing that brings me such joy about this is that in theory that data lasts forever. As long as you never expose that diamond to any light, uh, that data stays on that diamond. Uh, forever, as long as I'm, I'm alive, forever. Uh, uh, diamonds are also the best known semiconductor. And if you're not aware, we're really reaching the end of road of silicon. We can't go any faster, we can't go any smaller on silicon, so we need a new semiconductor. And it turns out that diamond is by far the best semiconductor. Uh, diamond uh, semiconductors can work at significantly higher voltages, power, temperature, and frequencies. Uh, so to give you a few examples of this, uh, this is a MOSFET logic circuit on a hydrogen doped diamond. Uh, that has successfully run at 300 degrees Celsius and 2,000 volts of electricity. Uh, the diodes below have run up to 1,000 degrees uh, Celsius and in theory can support well over 10,000 volts of electricity. Uh, that's important because these two basic units of computers are all that you need to fulfill the most important application of diamond uh, in the future, which is power conversion. So it turns out every time you change a type or a source of voltage, a form of power, on silicon you lose about 10% of that energy. So from your solar panels to the grid, you're losing roughly 10%. From the battery of your car to the motor of your electric car, you're losing roughly 10%. And that's because silicon has much more resistance uh, than other high band gap, uh, better uh, semiconductor materials, with diamond being the ultimate material. So to talk through a few applications of where we'll see diamonds early uh, as electronic devices, it's going to be everything from locomotives running diamond inverters at 20,000 or more volts of electricity to your electric vehicle getting 10% further range because it's a diamond inverter going from the battery to the motor versus a silicon inverter. Uh, diamonds also work in very extreme conditions. Uh, one example is a pilot that I'm quite excited about is embedding diamond electronic sensors within the engines of aircraft. So unfortunately it's too hot in today's modern engine to be able to use silicon sensors and that means you can't do real-time analysis to detect anomalies that end very badly as this uncontained failure of an Airbus, Airbus A380 engine uh, last year. Uh, with uh, diamond sensors, we can actually embed those sensors within the hot sections of the motors, get much better data, and also move to electromagnetic uh, devices rather than hydraulic systems in the motor, which will uh, improve reliability, reduce fuel consumption, reduce complexity as well. Um, so in a few generations of aircraft engines, I believe you'll see diamonds powering those engines. Um, Sort of to wrap up here, I, I want, want to make a key point, which is that the goal of the diamond growth industry is not to make shiny baubles. It's not to make gemstones. It's to make substrates for electronic devices. The goal is to go from a, a half inch, which is this uh, created by New Diamond Technology here, up to an inch, two inches, three inches, four inches of wafers of diamonds so that we can make this transition to diamond as the ultimate semiconductor material. And so something that I feel very passionate about is supporting the lab diamond industry because when I purchase a five carat diamond from NDT for six figures, that's money that's paying for the salaries of the PhDs that are working on expanding this capability, or it's the next machine or press that they're able to buy. And so in some senses, I truly believe that the gemstone aspect of the lab diamond space is really a means to the end of a far larger, far more lucrative, and far more important uh, area of uh, research, which is functional uses of diamonds. I'll skip over quantum computers because Daniel covered that uh, in depth and close out to say, to echo Daniel, is that in the decades ahead, diamonds will improve our health, they'll improve our vehicles, they'll undoubtedly improve our computers, and it's for that reason that I'm so passionate about laboratory-grown diamonds. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, questions? 
Thank you, Jason, for such a broad covering of the topics. But Mike, it's not really a question, it's a comment. I object to your using the term DLC. That is an amorphous carbon material. It was inaptly named way back in the 60s and 70s simply because it provided a hard surface, but it has no crystallinity to it. Uh, it does have SP3 bonds on it, and it does, I, as I said in my slides, it is an amorphous form of carbon that does have both SP3 and SP2 uh, bonds within that carbon. Hi, thanks for your talk. I understand you're handing around a, a replacement joint. Yes. Right. So I'm just curious if, whether that is um, a ceramic or a coated object, or is it purely it a is, diamond product? Sorry, sorry my, my deck's back. It is uh, grown on a tungsten carbide material, and then it's coated with uh, particles of titanium to bond to the bone where it's implanted. And then it is a polycrystalline diamond piece on top of that a carbide material. As a surface at the joint? Yes, so out of the surface. Uh, and I'm, I also have a vertebrae uh, joint with me as well that I'm happy to show you. Um, yeah. But the surface is diamond on diamond, polycrystalline diamond touching polycrystalline diamond. Polycrystalline. OK, thank you. until it is feasible to be using them for uh, hard drives and, and processors and computers? Um, what you classically think of as a processor with billions of transistors, I think will be measured in decades. It will be the non-typical uses of transistors where it will happen early on. Um, to go, for example, to go from alternating current, current voltage in a sinusoidal wave to a direct current of voltage only takes a handful of transistors. And so it'll be applications such as that where it happens first, where there are very specific use cases where you're talking about tens to hundreds to thousands of transistors in a very long time in decades before we've gone three orders of magnitude up to hundreds of millions or billions of transistors for what you classically think of as a computer. Well, thank you again. Join me in thanking Jason.